I was fortunate to meet a man named Steve Work, who uh, took me under his wing, brought me to the 11th 14. Since that time, we've had a moderate degree of success. Um, one of the few that you know, uh, I was honored enough to have my team nominate me for the Woody Flowers Award, which is probably one of the coolest things that's ever happened to me. Um, and I get to MC some regionals, so you might have seen me do some stuff and whatever, and kick some glass, and make fun of people who wear track pants for regionals. <laughs> You can call them what they want, they look stupid. <laughs> you know, it is what it is. I also uh, work for Innovation First International, they're the company that used to do the uh, control system for FIRST, and had a long path of we'll supporting FIRST, and will continue to support FIRST long into the future. So, before we get started, you know, with the nitty gritty robot stuff, you know, let's talk about the real world, let's talk about real life. Um, some quotes that I live by. Enthusiasm is one of the most powerful engines of success. When you do a thing, do it with all your might. Put your whole soul into it. Stamp it with your own personality. Be active, be energetic, be enthusiastic and faithful, and you will accomplish your object. Nothing great was ever achieved without enthusiasm. What does that mean? Well, it applies to the world of first, but again, the world of first is very small compared to everything. It's going to be bigger as we grow into the future, but right now, think about the big picture. Lots of you are trying to figure out what you are going to do with your life. And many of you, because you know you are good at science, you are good at technology, you have taught great math courses, are automatically going to be propelled down one road into one field. Be careful. Don't do what everyone's telling you you're supposed to do. Do what you want to do. Because if you are actually enthusiastic about something, you will work a lot harder and you will be better at it. This is a theme in this presentation. As opposed to being an average engineer, if you will go out, you know, instead of being you know, a 50 percentile engineer, if you can be a 99 percentile musician, trust me, you will be better off. And if you are passionate about music, but not so passionate about engineering, you'll have a better shot at being that 99 percentile. Always strive for excellence in whatever you're doing. I don't want to rant about the economy and one percent stuff, but I'm sure I don't that so much. Gentlemen, we are going to relentlessly chase perfection, knowing full well we will not catch it because nothing is perfect. But we are going to relentlessly chase it, because in the process, we will catch excellence. I am not remotely interested in just being good. A lot of times in the world of first robotics, people will tell you, everyone's a winner. It's true to a certain degree. You are winners by being a part of such an amazing program and the things you've learned. However, using the statement, everyone is a winner as a crutch, will only damage you in the long run. Because you know what? There's something to be said about winning. The goal isn't necessarily to win. The goal is to have an excellence while trying to win. Because while striving to be the best team in the world, you will learn many, many skills. The skills you learn on a first team, like figuring out if something's a coarse thread or a fine thread, or what screwdriver to use here, or how to calculate the gear ratio, is applicable to about 0.001% of the world. But knowing how to compete effectively is applicable to everything you're doing. Right now, all of you are competing for spots in the top colleges and universities in North America. You're also competing for scholarship spots. A uh, news article in the New York Times yesterday, 50% of the graduates of the class of 2011 uh, university are going to be unemployed. So you are competing in a dog-eat-dog -dog world for jobs. And those of you who know how to compete know how to strive for excellence and never quit and constantly iterate and constantly try and improve like the 2056s and the 67s of the world, those are the people who really get those top jobs. Those are the people who are hired right away. Something to think about. Yes, everyone's a winner, but you should always, always try to be a back the best. You can't just be like, in the job, well, everyone's a winner, but I'm unemployed. It, it doesn't work so well for everyone, except maybe Brandon the front row. <laughs> What lies before us and what lies behind us are small matters compared to what lies within us. And we, when we break what is within us in the world, miracles happen. There's something special. This is going to sound so sad. It sounds so cheesy because, unfortunately, there's a bunch of people in this world who bastardize saying anything nice, and anything nice comes out flowery, and people try to ignore it. But let, trust me on this one. There is something beautiful in every single one of you. I know it sounds corny, but there seriously is. And your goal in life is to bring that out for everyone else to see, whatever it may happen to be. And chances are, it's probably tied back to the first quote and what you're enthusiastic about and what you're passionate about. And finally, 
Limits, like years, are often just an illusion. For your entire life, people have been telling you what you cannot do. And some of it is true. I will not be able to fly with my hands. It's just not going to happen. However, I can jump pretty, I want to say, I can jump pretty darn high. Just because someone tells you you can't do something, doesn't mean you can't do it. A lot of teams said that no way you're going to triple balance with two long body robots. It's never going to happen. Some teams gave up on the dream. Others get it. Some people fear taking the next step. They fear moving on to the future. But guess what? There's nothing to be afraid about. Do not fall for illusions. Remember, be enthusiastic. Always try to win. Figure out what's inside and what's beautiful. And never give in to fears and limits. Except for obvious ones. Okay, so now that we've done that, we're going to get into the meat of the program, what probably most of you are here see, strategic design. What is strategic design? A lot of people, when they think about the engineering process, design process, and when they think about first robotics specifically, they think that it's all about, okay, CAD, CAD is design, computer-aided design. Sketching things out, figuring out how much torque you need to lift an arm, figuring out the geometry of that. They think that's what design is. That is a very important part of design. But strategic design is the good part. This is where you figure out what you want to do. Designing and building a robot is a lot of fun. Designing and building a cool robot that wins is even more fun. Trust me on that. It is very hard to go through the build process without an aim. What is your goal? If you want to figure out what to build, you have to try and figure out what you're building for. If I take a bunch of you in this room and I say, go build something awesome, we will see a lot of different things. My fault for not giving you a proper spec. First, and the game design committee give you a very good spec every year. It's not a perfect spec in your life. It's not what you're going to get to work for. Because there's a lot of interpreting, a lot of guessing, and a lot of figuring out. It's up to you to figure out what's best by evaluating their spec analytically and quantitatively. We'll talk about that in a second. So, what is your aim going to be in this whole process? Well, a lot of things you can do. My aim, always success and competition. However, this is a decision that every team needs to make on their own because lots of teams have different goals. Some teams want to have the prettiest robot. Um, some, you know, some very, very good teams. You know, one of my favorite teams in the world, T254, they are robot has to be perfect blue and everything. They do the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. This week they're dying a piece of something blue just to make sure they can put it on their wheels. That's cool, but this is their priority. They, their robot needs to look perfect. You look at an 1114 robot, how many of you look at one of them very closely before? Jonathan, what do you normally see when you look at them very closely? Uh, long wood, and yeah, they sort of slap together. Because for us, we'd rather spend more time practicing than get it perfect. So as opposed to designing you know, nice little spaces for the elevator, we grab some pink foam that we had a Mimi or a Memi or whatever it made for us. There's always wood on our robots. There's big golf clubs, a butter knife, a rake, a hockey stick. That was all in the iterative process of our 2008 World Championship. Went from rake to butter knife to golf club to strips of wax sand. In the end, it worked out. But you have to figure out what your own priorities are, and it's up to you. Beware of the cool factor. A lot of teams get sucked into, I want to build a cool robot. For example, this year, if you wanted to have a drive team that competed at the 90 and 90 percentile, you could have gone to our website, downloaded the SimPhone app, and then you could have built a kit on steroid for two or three days. You would have competed really well. A lot of teams knew this, but said, no, we want to do something cooler than that. We want to build a mechanic truck. Okay, I'm not going to pick on mechanics today. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a lot of reasons to do a mechanic truck. There are, you, know, you can make a weighted objectives table, and I'll talk about that in a bit, so we have a presentation on that. And you can find design. But some people will do it just because it's cool. If that's your decision, awesome. However, remember, this is a competition, and it's a unique kind of competition, because you have random alliance partners for every match. So if you focus too much, hey, nice match shirts back there. Mm -hmm. Were you there last weekend? Mm -hmm. You have fun? Yep. Like the new game? 
Yeah. Cool. I met one of the guys who worked on it. He's pretty legit and very good looking. Austin, are you really going to jerk me? Are you really going to jerk me? You're wearing a shirt with a giraffe on it, black pants, and Superman shoes. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm introducing one of the best drivers in first, Austin, who's also one of the biggest tools. <laughs> but seriously, if you, this is a competition where you have random alliance partners. And if you focus so hard on trying to have a cool robot with this craziest swerves and everything, well, and your competitive robot gets to the competition and doesn't move, people will say, oh, it's going to suck for your alliance partners. But you know what? It's going to suck more for you because you're going to feel that direct like, oh. Because you're going to see the looks on their eyes when you don't move and they lose the map, and you're going to feel kind of bad. So remember, there's an onus on you to make sure that you are doing what is best. However, that is a decision that you have to make. It's one of the themes of this presentation. Make sure your team is making decisions for the right reasons and based on what you want, not what someone else wants. Okay, so we talked about you know figuring out your aim, figuring out your objective. You now figure it out. You gotta analyze the game. So the first thing you need to do, and I don't know how much more I can stress this, is you need to read the rules. <laughs> there are so many teams that never read the rules. And I'm gonna tell you a couple stories in a second. My stories are my favorite thing, so. They are other people, though. So. Um, always examine the different ways to score points. There's always obscure ways to get points. In 2008, people were so focused on hurdling because that was the big objective, they forgot that you could drive a robot around in circles and get points. There was a little robot in 2008 that was just a circle, or maybe a nine-sided figure, I don't know. And they just drove around in circles. And sometimes they would just stop. Because sometimes stopping in the way is the most effective form of defense. And this little robot that people laughed at, people said, why would a team that good make a little robot that goes around circles? 2008 champions of the world. So, you know, it can work out for you. We'll talk about simplicity. I've got lots of examples of cool, simple, awesome robots. Exam ways to prevent your opponent from scoring. There's always discrete things you can do. Um, this year, one of them. Can someone think of a discreet way to stop your opponents from scoring this year? Well, how about this one? Forget about starving for a second, because that's more strategic. But with your robot, what if you had a robot that was just really big and had pizza boxes on it? And every time an inbounder tried to throw a ball in, it bounced off the pizza box. Trust me, if you had one of those robots and you had a drive train that could get on a bridge, you would have been a second round pick at every regional. And I'd say if you went to every regional in first this year, how many were there? Like 8,000 now? Okay, say there was 50. You would have been, you probably could have, would have won 15 of them. Be the second round pick, to one top alliances. Because it's what they were looking for. You know? Or you could have spent all your time, you know, trying to be one of the, how many teams in first this year? 2,300, 1,700, something. You could have been like, you know, one of 2,299 shooters. Or you could have set yourself apart. What are we talking about? Are you going to be 99th percentile, something rare? Or are you going to be 50th percentile of what everyone does? Or are you going to be the one that they're protesting about? Or are you going to be the one sitting out in your shoes like a hobo? Just saying. Oh, understanding the ranking system. OK. When I started giving this presentation in um, the early 2000s, this was a very important thing. Because the ranking system was always convoluted, a little bit complex, and was discreet. Then from 2004 to 2009, I basically forgot about this ball. I almost took it out, but I don't like to get rid of things because you know you never know when they'll come in handy. I do that with everything in my life. I keep a lot of stuff, ex-girlfriends, whatever. They just all kind of stick with me. You know? I kept this one in for a reason, because in 2010, they changed everything on us. And there was a ranking system you have to understand. And then last year, I talked about the 2010 ranking system, because it was still around. But then this year, they came up with something even newer and crazier, the cooperation break. There was a team this year, really good team, who I wish was at championship. Awesome team, awesome people. Part of the reason they aren't here is they didn't know the cooperation bridge had any value. They never read the rules. They just thought it was a white bridge in the center of the field. They wondered during practice why we were going on it. it you know, it, 
They had no idea. There were plenty of teams who even read through that section but didn't understand the magnitude of cooperation. That cooperating, which is a very easy task to complete, was just as important as winning. And even if you're one of those teams that can score you know, 10, 12, or 10, 17, 17, 18 balls in the match, by the way, that's ridiculous, and I, I fear playing on the line sign if I get, get that far. Um, go off the bridge, <laughs> two stupid robots on the stupid bridge. Boom, it's more important than any of that, or equally important. You have to know this, you have to read this stuff. So many teams missed out. So many teams figured, oh, well, I don't even need to go on a bridge. <laughs> and as a result, struggled a little bit. Some very, very good teams early on in the season didn't capture the full value of the competition bridge. They were so focused on winning, they forgot about this thing. And so instead of seeding first like they usually do, they seeded lower down. Some amazing teams who normally always seed in the top two somehow never found a way to cooperate on a consistent basis. 25 to 6. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've never seen them that low in the standings before. But it just, it's crazy how these perspectives and stuff come on. If I want to sit down, Libby Cayman's trying to take five seats up up front, you know. It just happens. Okay, so we're going to talk about all that cool stuff in a second. Chokehold strategies. This is something I should probably throw out in my presentation as well, because there really hasn't been a chokehold strategy in the game in a long time. However, it's so cool, and it's an element of game theory I wanted to bring up. A strategy which, when executed, guarantees victory independent of any action by your opponents. In simple terms, if you execute this strategy, a reasonable strategy, if you're able to execute this, you will win every single match independent of any action by your opponents. Determine if one exists should be the first step in game analysis. This should be done algebraically. What that means is you find a subset of points and ways to eliminate points from being scored to your opponents, and you put that on one side of your equation. And then, you set an inequality. And on the other side of your equation, you add up all the leftover points your opponents can get. If that formula always has one side greater than the other side, suddenly you have found a chokehold strategy. In 2002, you were given 10 points for every goal you had on your side of the field. There were three of them. You were given one point for every goal, every ball that was in a goal, but that goal had to be on your side of the field. You were also given 10 points for every robot that you had in your end zone at the end of the match, your color or the other color. So, if I was a team and I said, hey, if I grab all three goals, get them into my zone, I get 30 points. My opponents can get zero ball points now, because ball points require the goals to be in that zone. But, oh wait, they can get 40 points of robots in their zone, except, what if I can guarantee they can never get my robot in that zone? So what if I can guarantee I'm not going to be in their end zone, shouldn't be that hard, and can get three goals? 30-30 top. What was the tiebreaker that year? Anyone want to take a guess? Nope. Number of goals. So if I had all three, and there's only three on the field, I'm pretty sure they're not going to win that tiebreaker. Choke goals back. Not that simple to decipher. However, most people figured it was impossible. There was a handful of teams, three teams that figured, hey, let's try it, let's go for the gusto. Team 71, 365, 384. 365 and 384 did a pretty good job in it, but they weren't at that 99 percent call that bad. Team 71 was at about 150 percent call that bad. They just, they just obliterated it. Basically, these goals weighed 180 pounds each, and they were spread across the field, which is then 24 feet. So they like, we have to be the fastest ones to get out there. However, they knew really they had to drag 540 pounds plus their own weight with them. So they had to have a super, super low gear. And then they even realized, wait a second, if we have a super, super low gear, it's still not going to be enough. We need traction to make sure we're not going to get close. So they said, why don't we give you metal spikes into the park? Oh, that's kind of crazy. What about making more within the rules? We use file cards to basically the cards like Velcro. But then the question was, how are they going to grab these three goals, which the other ones were 18 feet apart? How are they going to do that? Well, they made the robot start standing up. It would, and I'm not going to do it because I want dirty my suit, but it would fall over, send out these wicked huge five-foot arms, which had claws on them, and they would 
zoom into the goals full speed, boom, 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 one, two, three, go on all. Then they would pull back. And they sacrificed so much to guarantee they would get those goals. And we're going to talk about trade-offs or whatever. They said, well, our robot's not going to be able to turn. So it had no ability to turn. The robot can only go straight. And then it would move at about an inch and a half per second, like a slob, down the field. But basically, after we got those three goals in the first five seconds of the match, it was over. It was over. Ron Partridge, one of the best announcers in first song, he hadn't done it in a long time, but man, he was awesome. And you know, if you're a first announcer or MC, you're always taught, always be positive. Never say anything that is negative. Never say a match is over. And so Ron's watching a match, that championship, and you know, Eli, he says, well, it's never over until it's over, but there's not much hope. <laughs> they maybe had the three goals and they marched all their way to the championship. I mean, the immense awesomeness of this robot could be only told by one match, because at one point, um, they were on the field in Team 66, and they were playing um, truck down back in the nobody pushes truck down era, when literally no one could push truck down, and Han. So we're not talking about two bad teams, we're talking about two of the best teams at first at that time. And Han still is the best team at first. So 67 and 68. So what happens? Beatty goes, they got the other grab goals, but they get one, they get another. Trump Town grabs their goal. Trump Town huge one, so they only have two. They have a shot. So they stick their arm out, and their claw grabs on top by accident. The claw was their claw, had no ability to release. It was a one way latch, kind of like level 14 standard in 2010. So they didn't really know what to do, so they just kind of closed their arms. And Hawk comes swinging with them. <laughs> so now they have two goals. And pop. Fuck down. Who strategic mistake decides, well, wait a second, what if we grab one of Baby's goals and try and pull it away from them? So they grab that. And Trump down couldn't release goals either. <laughs> so now Baby has a robot, 540 pounds of goals, and two other robots. <laughs> And they just keep moving <laughs> down the field. So they're dragging hot bot and hot bot. nobody pushes truck down, but baby sure as heck drags them. <laughs> and they drag them into the zone. It, it's just like the most ah, awesomeness. And, and for that reason alone, it is a shame that Team 71 is not here at the championship. <laughs> Allow me to go on a rant. I do these from time to time. When a team wins four championships, four championships? They should be allowed to come to the first world championship forever. <laughs> forever. They should be here. Team 177 who went to Einstein the last six years in a row, they should be here. The Thunder Chickens, my dear friends, six trips to Einstein in their history, or five trips to Einstein, one of the most inspirational teams in first, they should be here. They definitely shouldn't be here because they were one point short in these weird point systems that need to be real bad. Anyway, I'm going to rant. I can't fix that stuff. There's a lot of great teams that should be here. They all can't be here, of course, but I mean, we need to uh, think carefully about how to reward excellence and how to recognize excellence. Both after the first five So, yeah, so cool stuff. If one is this, it's going to be really, really hard to perform. Team 469 has a virtual chokehold strategy with very, it's hard to say if it was or it wasn't, it depends on a lot of factors. Regardless, 469 was the only team who was going to be able to build that robot. I mean, 469, I'm pretty sure, has made perpetual motion machines with their shot. It usually involves round aluminum tubing as well together, that's got it. So, um, why are those numbers relevant in 2011? I'll ask you again at the end of the presentation. I can do a little bit of an algebra lesson here, but. It's not super, super important. Oh God, the safety guys are here, take me away. <laughs> Sorry, it's not my fault. Okay, cost-benefit analysis. Um, we always talk about analyzing these games. It's very important to do things quantitatively. Because if you're just gonna analyze things qualitatively, I can say, Balancing is more important than shooting. And you could say shooting is more important than balancing. And then we're done. The conversation is effectively over because anything said after that point means nothing. You need to look at things quantitatively. So for every task, you need to figure out the point value associated with it. You also then need to look at this difficulty. What's a good way to examine difficulty? The amount of time it needs to make it happen? Both in a map 
in, in your build season. Um, 2012, what's easier to do? Drive up on top of a bridge, or build a scooter that can handle the variances of stuffy balls, squishy balls, poke balls, glossy balls, torn balls. Propel them at the basket with the right amount of backspin to uh, move, you know, about this thing. I don't know. Climbing onto a bridge seems really hard, especially since there's a freaking iPhone app that'll tell you how to do it. <laughs> so, the best tasks to perform are those which are relatively easy, yet provide big points. It's a ratio, folks. Minimize the denominator, maximize the numerator. Something else to think about. Denying your opponent's 10 points is just as good as scoring 10 points. Usually. Something to think about. Denying your opponent's 10 points in this game, say by playing a defense or a shooter, isn't a true denial of 10 points. Because the expected value of making someone stop, miss four shots, is lower. Can anyone tell me why? Speak up, just shout it out. There's no guarantee they would have made them. The ball. Uh, um, no guarantee of them making them one is a good one, so you have to reduce that effective value. But there's another very, very important one that I think a lot of teams missed out on. The ball stay on their side of the field. Close, You're, that, that is part of it. Pardon me? Also, but the big, the big one. What do most defensive teams end up doing? And why are you afraid to send team 35 old blah 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 over to the other side of the field? Penalties. Penalties, penalties, penalties. Because every team you think they can you know, cut a team down from hitting five shots, they're going to hit them in the key three times, they're going to touch their bridge, you know, and unless it's Queen City, that's really bad. I mean, unless it's uh, Mars, it's really bad. Mars can touch someone's bridge all you want. Oh, whichever one. One of them is bad. Does anyone know what the rule is on that, by the way? Anyone? No. We'll find out tomorrow morning at the driver's meeting. Ah, yes. Yeah. Pardon? The, the rule for the bridge touching? No, no, it's okay. It was a, it was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> obviously wasn't funny for the gentleman's back. <laughs> okay, prioritization. You now examine the cost benefit analysis. You figured out what tasks are most important. Now you need to prioritize them. Make two separate lists. Your first one is the desired robot quality. I mean, this is like if I wanted to design a prototypical quarterback, you know, I would want to give him Mike Vick's legs, not his sense of morality. Uh, I would want him to have a laser cannon arm like Peyton Manning. I would want him to have Tony Rose's good looks. Uh, I would want all these things to come together. In terms of role, so those are the points. With robots, we're talking speed, we're talking power, agility, center of gravity. I, just a theme here today. Robot functionality. You want your robot to be able to you know, maybe shoot balls, climb bridges, traverse the field. At this point, you convert two lists and design on things. Because these things will come together very quickly. Like, for example, if you want your robot to climb bridges effectively, please don't make it five feet tall with a 30 pound scooter with a flywheel at the very top. What were you thinking? <laughs> I know what they were thinking. They weren't thinking about this. <laughs> Okay, golden rules. If you're gonna walk away from this presentation, you're only gonna remember one slide. Well, make sure it's the first slide. The slide with the quote, not the slide on the last slide. If you're gonna walk away with the second slide, this slide. Golden rule number one. Always build within your team's limits. Simple to remember, easy to follow, if you know what your limits are. And like in life, some of these limits are illusions. However, as Michael Jordan said, it's only often that they are illusions. There are other times where they are out there. Evaluate your abilities and resources honestly and realistically. Your limits within first robotics are defined by manpower, budget, and experience. If you have a team that's a rookie team with a bunch of freshmen who've never seen a robot before, you need to bring it in at first. This does not mean you're going to have to suck in your first year. Absolutely not. You can still do it amazingly. However, uh, be careful what you do. Budget. A lot of people don't like to talk about it at first, but it's an issue. The playing field is not absolutely level. If you can spend $20,000 at the master of the season, 
there's just a lot of neat stuff you can do. If your budget is only, you know, four hundred dollars, hey, that's not that to build a on steroids. You go to simplesubotics.com slash app and find out how to do it. I really urge you to do this stuff. But you need to pay attention to these limits. Avoid building unnecessarily complex functions. I keep bringing up the kit bond on steroids. It's a very, very good drive train that's super, super simple. <laughs> Stay simple. On the other hand, limits, like fears, are often just an illusion. As you get more experience, start cautious and pushing a few boundaries. If your budget is a limit, go out and fundraise. Some teams think that team, oh, I think they made money. Team 254. This year, how did they get their welding done? Because they didn't have a welding function. Well, by the time they hit yes, I mean S in the phone book, they had one. They literally called everyone. They split up the phone book and just kept calling. Hi, we're from First Team 254. We've accomplished this in our community. We, this is what we do to help kids learn. And I'm a student on this robotics team. I'd like to have the same experience that my peers did. We'd be interested in donating maybe five hours of welding time. And they did that over and over and over again. You don't need to be in cheesy groups to be able to do that. Anyone can do that. I know in some communities it's easier than others with the thoughts of industry compared to less industry, but it doesn't hurt even trying. So, push boundaries. Manpower low. Take your robot on stage in school assembly. Trust me, if you do that, you play some good music, play some Jay-Z, people will come out to the team. It's as simple as choosing a good song. If you ball so hard, they will come. <laughs> so, these limits that are defined, you can expand them, but you need to do it. You need to make the effort. So yes, there are limits. You know, as Chris Jericho would say, tear the walls down. Uh, no one watches wrestling. Why don't people watch wrestling anymore? <laughs> Do you smell what the rock is? I'll stop on this guy. If anyone wants to talk wrestling afterwards, I'm here. I just wish someone would play wrestling theme music right now and then I come to Golden rule number two! If a team has 30 units of punk robot and functions a maximum of 10 units, it's better to do three things at 10 out of 10 than five things at 6 out of 10. The jack of all trades is the master of none. It's much, much more important to be the best at something than to be mediocre at a lot of things. I mean, we talk about this all the time. I, I was just listening to a podcast on the way here about the NBA. And they're talking about, you know, a lot of these college players, they come with multi-skill sets, and they're kind of mediocre at everything. No one wants that. But if you have someone like, I don't know, Matt Bonner, who all he can do is shoot threes, he can't do anything else, he has no value, he's weird. He's still... <laughs> Making eight million dollars a year because all he can do is put a ball in a basket consistently just because he practices a lot. You can do that too. If you're a team that can say, hey, I don't know, maybe not take up much real estate on the bridge, always lower it and get on, this year you're winning regionals as opposed to being one of like 2,200 shooters, you know, who take only manage to take four shots in a match because they don't, can't pick up balls very well and they hit one of them. Congratulations, we're all winners. <laughs> I don't even mean that in a demeaning way. Anyone can be the ultimate champion in this game. Anyone. It doesn't matter what type of resources you have. If you build within your limits, you follow these golden rules. Don't be a plain old fish in a very big pond. Make yourself the freaking hippest, best looking fish out there with a little bit different, I don't know, maybe you have three wings or something. Just don't have <laughs> so now trade-offs. You have all these things that your robot can do, that you want your robot to do, but because of your defined limits, you realize, how am I going to pick what I want to do? Speed versus power. Complexity versus durability. Shooting versus balance. I mean, this year, you want to build a really good shooting robot, one way to make life a lot easier was to put the shooter up high. I made a joke about it earlier, but you... It makes life one easier if you shouldn't come up high than shooting down low. However, if you have the shooter up high, you have a high center of gravity, which makes balancing a lot harder to do. So, how do you make your decision? 
How do you figure out which one to do? Maybe the right choice is based on your analysis in terms of the your season. Go back to the priority list. Once you have that priority list, and I'm serious about this one, every team from a rookie team to a Hall of Fame team, you print out their priority list and stick it on the wall in their shop. Or, you know, put it on a Google Doc or, I don't know, one of these many websites out there. You have to follow that priority list. Because I've seen lots and lots of good teams who at the end of the build season realize, oh wait, we're 10 pounds overweight. What are we going to take off? Or let's say, I'm one pound overweight. What am I going to take off? Say, maybe you have a choice between, well, I'm going to weaken up my bridge in a little bit, or I can pull one motor out of my shoe. Because I already have two motors in there. There is a right decision to this one and a wrong answer. Pull the freaking motor out of your shooter. First of all, you don't need two motors in a shooter this year. You can really do it with one with some problem here and your side. So that's not even the point. Now, how is he basically your priority list? The point value is huge. Absolutely immense compared to the possibility of you making shots. Because the success rate of balancing is a lot higher than shooting percentage. When we talk about the jack of all trades, master of none, I'm going to talk about some examples from the past. 2007, there was a rookie team. And basically, they said, We're just rookies. We're not going to try and do everything. They were mentored by a team who built this complex, pop open, crazy only ramp, and their arm fell over, whatever. Their veteran team had a lot of resources. It looks pretty good. But this rookie team said, Forget it. Let's use the kit bot, which eventually became the kit bot on steroids. Let's use the kit bot. And build a simple single joint arm. The high roll of the rack, 2007, we never won't this. Or three points, we have to score up there. They said, eh, forget it. They said, skip the high roll. Simple robot, like that. A lot of people were like, oh, the VD is the second round pick. <laughs> or they win two regals on the number one alliance and go on to never lose a regional ever. Ladies and gentlemen, introduce the team 2056. Last year, there was a team, and they said, you know, led by a mentor who has won a world championship in the past and is now on Team 254. He said, well, we could try and do everything, or, you know, instead of, you know, we, we just can't, we have a nice way to do a single joint arm with no complexity, but we'll never be able to pick up off the floor. And so a bunch of people made fun of like, you're a floor pickup, you know, it's like, well, oh, you're a tool. So they went with no floor pickup, and because of that, the robot was done for the first time ever in four weeks. They were able to practice an obscene amount of time. And even without the floor because they were done so early, they finished their single team of time in like week six of those So they had nothing to practice on floor at once. So they said, well, let's try and figure out how to do two shoes. People were like, you don't have to play that, how can you do it? But they had the time to figure it out. The robot never broke down, so it was so simple. Shifters? What shifters? Single speed gearbox. In 1503 on Einstein last year, one, two regions. While well, all these other teams who had these flimsy apps, flimsy butt floor pickups, you know, <laughs> that would drop down and you know grab the tubes and then you know have floppy tube syndrome walking over to the goal, or 50 over it, poof, or the apps did it over the back. <laughs> the sound effects. Um, who's my simple example for this year? P4000. Right, there's a lot of examples. How many before the 294? Uh, their, their first regional, they had two wheels of cast. And by the time they got to Michigan State, they could put two balls on top of the bridge, they put two balls for another team. Then they got a balancing safety. They won the one. Wait, fourth pitch. Right. Then they made an eagle drive that could go to the barrier and stop the bridge at Tennessee. They were uh, the fifth line captain. Fifth line captain. I mean, how many teams did you see this year that had complex shooters, complex ball pads, weird ways to get the bridge that didn't make the elimination range? On the other hand, these simple yet effective robots with a lot of practice, you saw them all go on. It's amazing what's the power of simplicity in this. It's, it's absolutely crazy. And it doesn't just work for young teams, 1503. Veteran team, they've won multiple regionals in their past, always was a contender at championship. But in 2010, 
Ooh, they had a rough time because they went with a very complex design. They tipped over most times when they went over the bump because they made homemade castor bills. I mean, you know, as opposed to buying terrible castor bills from the store, they made their own because they made it worse. But they learned lessons. They learned lessons. Because they, remember, teams that apply to more than the paper tend to fail. This applies in your lives, ladies and gentlemen. In school, if you decide, okay, I'm going to be on the robotics team, and I'm going to run track, and I'm going to do the yearbook, and I'm going to play the trombone. You know, some people can do all these things at once. You know, some people are these awesome Renaissance men and women who can do all sorts of stuff. Other people burn themselves out, and they go through high school, and it's not a fun experience. And at the end, when they get their, you know, I know you Americans do GPA and stuff. You can't review that. You know, instead of having the 95 average they need to get into the school they want. They have an 83, which is good. But guess what? Those kids with the 95s, even despite what they tell you, it's all about your extracurricular. As you need a live IP to try and make you more well-rounded, most schools are just <laughs> about average. I'm not kidding you. I hate to break your hearts, but I know a lot of people in admissions departments at different universities. Take your marks, man. They really do matter. And if you let them suffer because you're focusing too hard and trying to do too many things, you will hurt yourself in the long run, and it's not a fun feel. This applies to all you firsters in the room. Because if you're at this seminar, that means you're crazy and you're dedicated about FIRST. And FIRST is an awesome, awesome program. I want you to be dedicated about it. However, your grades are the most important thing. Because, I mean, when you graduate, it's cool to talk to a person in a job interview, and it will get you places. It will make employers vote twice. But you probably won't get into that interview if you don't have the right average GPA. Or you didn't go to the right school. Seriously, I see, I see all the adults nodding their heads. I see all the adults nodding their heads and the teachers nodding their heads. A lot of the kids are looking a little bit nervous right now, the mom is sweating. I mean, hope, hopefully they'll go back to the room and study a little bit after this. I'm looking at one student in particular. <laughs> Other trade offs. So, okay, you're trying to figure out what you can do, you have a couple functions. Try and do them together. Try to maximize functionality with simple additions and modifications and negatives. 2008, my, um, we had this robot, and we wanted to make sure you know, we could shoot in an effective package. A lot of teams that year had claws that would load the ball into a shooter and then would shoot. We were fortunate enough to stumble upon the idea of using our claw as our shooter. Uh, 2010. Using, okay, lots of teams want to hang, but you have to dedicate extra motors and such to hang. We figured, wait a second, why don't we use the same motors from our drive train to hang? We got that inspiration to keep it before we did it in the past. Team 67 didn't want to dedicate an extra motor to hanging that year. Use gas shocks. And it was even cooler about that. They could hang after the map. So when you thought you beat them on Einstein, they actually got two extra points. That sucked. <laughs> <laughs> This year, the most popular one that lots of you have been doing, use your intake to help manipulate the bridge. Or, like a team that's in front of me right here, they had a device to help them get over the barrier to 610. They also use it to help them with triple balancing. Find ways, as opposed to putting two separate mechanisms on, combine it into one. That's how you take it to the next level while still maintaining simplicity and still working within your limits. Like I said earlier, we're making trade-offs. Remember your initial priorities. Always let your strategic priorities dictate your design. Don't let emotion dictate your design. Don't let the biggest guy in the room dictate your design. Don't let the smoothest talker dictate your design. Priority list. You must stick to your priority list. Other tips. This type of strategic analysis is a must. There's a tendency to skip this stage and head straight to design and implementation. If you do that, that's cool. I mean, you can spend three days brainstorming to figure out a really, really good robot. Or you could just start cutting metal right away because you feel that's really necessary. If your build season is so poorly managed that you need those three extra days, that means you need to probably watch my seminar on your team. You must know what you want to do before you can figure it out. Like the great Wayne Grutsky used to say, I don't go to where the puck is, I go to where the puck is going to be. You must know what you want to do 
before you can figure out how to do it. That's why this analysis is important. Be realistic when evaluating strategies. What am I gonna make fun of this year? I mean, 2011, what do you think in first, or at least, let's go with the championship, which is the best of the best, except it is, it's the best of the best in the people who can play really quite fast on the computer. What do you think the average number of tubes per match score by team was? Someone give me an answer. So I'm hearing three, I heard five from someone, two. Well, someone was closer. One. Pardon? One point five. Have you heard this before, Jonathan? No, I haven't. This is a fancy web application developer. Now, yeah, it was about 1.5, maybe even a little bit lower. Jeff, do you remember what ended up being a chance? 1.4. This is Jeff Allen, who runs uh, stats and research for people on 14. He knows a lot of stuff. But he's an accountant, so he's running the college. <laughs> 1.4 cubes per match. So when teams are so focused on making sure their robot can score six or seven and try to come up with these crazy things, well, if you're doing three, you're double the team's championship. I mean, you could score 1.7 or 1.8 tubes per match to be the number one seed in the championship last year. It, you need to be really realistic with these things. Because if you assume that you have to do too much, that means you're going to try and be unnecessarily complex. Stay simple. Be realistic. Temper your goals. Revisit past seasons and actually watch what teams do. Pay attention to the sound section. Remember, you have partners. It's okay to depend on them for certain tasks. How much you leave up to your partners is decided by your goals and rules. Basically, you know, if you were one of those teams who could do it all and has done it all in the past, then it's okay to try and build a robot that does everything. However, uh, if you're one of those teams you're struggling, you're new, you've lost some resources or whatever, keep it simple. Maybe just work on the bridge and see that some one of your partners is going to be able to source the balls for you. Think about these things very, very carefully. However, be careful not to leave too much in your partner's hands, otherwise their hands will be very full and things will kind of fall apart. I mean, there were some teams last year who decided, well, there's only two minibot poles in a match and there's three robots, so we're just not going to build a minibot. That might have been a poor decision. Why? Go back to your priority list and remember how many points the mini model was. 40 freaking points for this stupid little muck muck. I mean, <laughs> it all ties together. Trust me, everything, you know, you could put this on a bulletin board and tie it together like you were at the CIA. It all plays out. I hate that slide. Okay. <laughs> Scaling. Strategic design is done. That's when strategy people from the team, they go and watch basketball for the rest of the season. Assume your mechanical guys will build something awesome and cool or whatever. And now it's time for competition season. You know, if you're pumped, you're ready to go. And then, but since you were watching basketball and you didn't pay attention to your mechanical guys, they stopped paying attention to the priority list, your robot is very Well, how do you make it better now? Frankly, it is pretty much it's very, I shouldn't say pretty much impossible. If more teams are going, more regional sound is just a system which allows teams more play, so there is time to iterate. But it's very difficult to improve your robot in the middle of the season. However, it's very easy to improve your scaling strategy, and you can get a huge leg up on the competition by doing this. So, it's very important, it's neglected by a lot of teams. Some teams don't scale because they don't see the value in effort to jump. Some teams don't scale because they say it's not fun. Just a blatant lie, scaling is the best thing ever. <laughs> and you get right over the an excellent way to involve more students at your competition. You were one of these teams of 50 kids, you know, and only six work in the pits. Instead of having 44 look like buffoons dancing to Cotton Eye Joe, you can have 12 from Sally, and then you only have 32 buffoons. <laughs> hey, you're minimizing the amount of kids that look like Austin. This is crazy. <laughs> You should have chirped me when you got in this room, man, I told you. <laughs> it's crucial for two main reasons. You can predict your opponent's strategy for future matches. Also, alliance picking. There's this whole thing called alliance selection that happens in first events. I know some people are unaware of it, you can tell when they come out there and don't know what they're doing. But it's so, so important. It's especially crucial getting a good second round pick. Because at any event, you can walk in, 
watch maybe 20 minutes of matches, and you can know who the top three teams are. That's no problem. When I see people like, oh yeah, we we're through the first four picks of our pick list. It, it was no problem. It's like, good for you. You want a cookie with that? It's figuring out who the 24th best team is at a regional 30. Or figuring out who the 24th best team is at a division of 99. <laughs> very, very important. If you don't scout, you will not figure that out. You're just going to guess and you're going to pick a team based on, I don't know, what their team number is, what their jerseys look like. I mean, it's true, there's a high correlation between having a really nice uniform and getting picked. <laughs> Seriously, I just made that up, I don't have stats to prove that, but I'm sure it's true. <laughs> I mean, would you really pick a second team in the second round that didn't have a team uniform, that didn't even have a team shirt? It would make me pause for a second. <laughs> it, I'm serious. We're going to talk about discrete factors in scouting in a second, which is actually something that uh, bothers people, but it's actually... Okay, advanced scouting. This is going to be the fun part of the presentation. I even brought a special guest for this one because we're going to debunk some myths right now. I'm sick and tired of hearing we see the letters OPR. First of all, what does OPR stand for? That's not a real abbreviation. Offensive power rating. I know what it stands for. <laughs> <laughs> it should have a meaningful name. In 2004, before everyone, you know, before this became public. Um, myself, Jeff Bow, and Ian McKenzie started using linear algebra to try and predict match results. And we came up with something that we called calculated contribution. Didn't tell anyone about it. We kept it, you know, it was our little thing. We kept it quiet for a long time. We, quite, we were going to put it in our scouting database one time, but it seems like whenever we put it in our scouting database, someone would feel the need to complain about, oh, you, you, you were mean to our team. You know, so took that stuff out. Never put it in there. Then, other people, because I mean, linear algebra, you okay, all learned it in the first year. You know, it's not that hard to figure it out. You're taking it in the first year right now? What school you at? There we go. There we go. Math, math, the engineering. Okay, I use the TA. Okay, I use I use the TA on um, science, but how science is how to follow it. But um, it's really easy stuff. Anyway, it came about, and people were very skeptical about it at first. Because basically, what you're doing is, you're taking, oh, I got this next slide. I'm jumping ahead of myself because I'm so worked up right now. <laughs> Regardless, looking at past regionals is important. Advanced scouting, you know why? There's a high correlation between past success and future success. At this event, I'm sure a lot of us, if we were to predict the 96 teams that are going to make the elimination rounds in the divisions, I'm sure a lot of us get 50%, no problem. Some of us get 75%. Some might be able to get 80%. So, and that's just based on past results. Before this season, there are, I bet you, a lot of people have given that same game, 96 teams, before the season even started, get 30 to 40%. You know, uh, it's important. That's why looking at past results you know, has value. Don't get too caught up in past results. Teams change. Don't be so obsessed with what happened last year. Really don't be obsessed with what happened five years ago. Okay. OPR. Calculated contribution. How can I know how well a team performed without watching their matches? It's a legitimate concern if you have not seen any of the team's matches. Because the easiest way to properly scale is to watch the matches. If you can't, you can just look at your average score. But that only tells you part of the story. Because three teams play in a match. Who really was contributing? That's the basis behind OPR. Um, the idea of doing this came from the NBA, where they have something called adjusted plus minus, where you look at every minute of basketball players. Look. Because what they found was um, players with high scoring averages weren't necessarily the best players. Some players with high scoring averages their teams always manage to lose. <laughs> Allen Iverson, Philadelphia 76ers, one of the best pure scorers that they've ever seen in the NBA. His team always managed to lose, but everyone thought he was the best player in the league because he always had the highest scoring averages because he played the Coles Jordan era. And, you know, he, well, why was Allen Iverson affecting his team so negatively? Not only anyone ever figured that one out, well, maybe because he's a crazy man, but beyond that, <laughs> How can you prove that Allen Iverson was affecting this team negatively? And how was it in these teammates? Well, they looked at every minute that was played on the court and compared to the second team. 
and basically set up everything as a linear equation. And then you take all the linear equations and you solve them. And then you can average contribution to the final score. And Alan Iverson's contribution was considerably less than his points per game. So even though he was putting 30 points into the basket, he was somehow taking points out of the basket. <laughs> It's pretty, and that a lack of defense, a lack of involvement in his teammates. For example, this year, there's some teams, when you have them on the field, they score a lot of points. But they said, can you lose matches? Because they hog all the balls. And it's scoring all these points. They're only making a couple shots. And they're feeding their opponents, who then are able to take those balls, get them outside the field, and use them effectively. Let the buyer beware. So, you take it, look at every team contribution represented by a variable. For every alliance that happens throughout the tournament, I'm not going to go too much into the details of analysis because I know a lot of you haven't taken it before. Let T of I plus T of J plus T of K equals S, where S is the number of points scored by the alliance. You now have a giant matrix, matrix, or plural singular. Solve it. I mean, if you're one of those people who has fun with itself, be like me, they were used by hand. Like, I do enjoy row reducing, but that's another story. Solve the matrix, use a computer, write a program, do whatever. You now calculate, calculate the average contribution of each team throughout the region. Neat stuff, cool stuff. How valuable is this data? Depends on the game. In 2008, the year that OPR gained a lot of popularity, it was wicked useful. Because the game was what I would define as separable. The individual efforts of each team could be separated from their partners. Everyone was trying to contribute towards the same goal, but because of the lack of influence of defense and the lack of, you didn't need as much teamwork between the teams. Two teams could just kind of go about their business. It was pretty good. And OPR had a very good, the correlation you should always be looking at is actual points in the of the match, which you get by actual failure. A game that was bad for OPR was a game that was bad for everything, including spectators and players, lunacy. <laughs> Why might have lunacy been bad? But the scores were random. 54% of the points of lunacy, you know who scored them? Human players. Not robots, just dudes and dudettes just throwing balls. It wasn't that hard to do. One of the best human players in first that year was this guy in the classics. He just sat there and brought balls in. The reason he was good because he was patient, unless the other ones were just chucking like maniacs. <laughs> chucking like maniacs. <laughs> OPR in 2012, a lot of people wanted me to talk about it. It's awful! Okay, so, and I mean, Jeff, please feel free to chime in. There's a mic if you want to go to it right now. But I'm going to, we have to start a Google Doc, but it's like four pages long about everything that's wrong with OPR in 2012. Number one, okay, typically OPR is how good, but you can keep the raw match to us, that's fine. Except this year, the raw match scores, if Isaiah takes a three point penalty, I get three points for that. So if you just look at the raw match scores, my OPR is going to be higher, just on the basis that I played a tool that doesn't know how to play defense for that. <laughs> it doesn't include the cooperation bridge, because you don't actually get any points for the cooperation bridge. So you have to figure that one out. And the cooperation bridge is so valuable, and the good teams figure it out. Some good teams would take a lead after autonomous mode, maybe score three more balls, and then go sit on that bridge. They would win the match, they would get the competition bonus, but their score would be lower. So, then some people on Chief, you know, because Chief is like the bastion of intelligence these days, said, okay, put that in a factor based on the competition percentage. Okay, interesting way of doing it. Except if you make that factor very low, then it punishes good teams who go to cooperate, cooperate early. Cooperate is the proper term. A high factor favors bad teams. Because, for example, if you have a really, really good team, like 67, they go to cooperate in that block game the match, you know, with a minute left. And then some random team comes up with five seconds left, you're awarding them both the same factor. Except one team contributed a lot more. And one team's scoring during the match diminished heavily. So, that messes it up. Variance amongst regionals. Defense is very hard in 2012. So, effective D typically was only seen at the stronger regionals, thereby lowering OPRs at the tougher events. 
it's still awful, second slide. Fall shortages. With balls being limited, limited supply, alliances of swords actually decrease the alertness due to certain thresholds going on the alliance. If you have three teams on alliance that are scoring at a very good regional, this will happen, and then you can say championship, it happened. The scores kind of drop a bit because there's a limited amount of supply of balls. Also, at good events, smart teams were starting to starve balls. And if you have three teams trying to occupy that key, it doesn't work out well. Teams bump into each other. I mean, it's, it's messy. Chaos confusion. So, Jeff, did I think I missed? I didn't want to put the whole Google Doc in here. I heard Do you want to explain that one? And please use the term hybrid robot makeout. So that sounds like a good robot out here. Thank you. Okay. Um, so this year, I guess this is another case of uh, regional variants that he was talking about. So in lesser regionals where you had teams that couldn't score themselves or couldn't put a delay in their auto mode, couldn't score first hybrid mode, sorry. Uh, there were teams who had a good pickup that all it would do was spit out into the teams with better, more consistent hybrid modes. And so that hybrid team would score the points. So in these poorer regionals, the hybrid points are more, and because they're weighted, they're going to have an even better score. But in the stronger regionals where everyone's shooting themselves, these points get balanced out among everybody. So in essence, the stronger teams were able to sh make out with the poorer partners, get the advantage in the OPR because they get to do it more often than the other teams in the stronger regionals. So, all these factors, it's still a useful metric. Again, it's useful if you haven't seen the math. However, OPR was conceived because average score wasn't turning out to be its most useful metric. Yeah, so, guess what? This year, total tally off score is a pretty good indicator, some of OPR. Hybrid score might even be a better indicator. This gives you an idea. If you can figure stuff out in hybrid, they can usually figure it out in driver control. Hybrid scoring is a lot easier than driver control scoring this year, but these are good tippers. Why is there an obsession with OPR right now? I will give you one word to describe why there's an obsession with OPR right now in the first community. Bah. <laughs> sheep. Everyone is a freaking sheep. You see when someone posts something on Chief Delphi, so you believe it. We get these mindsets where Oh, and you know, FRC top 25 says that this team is in the top 25. They must be good. We don't actually bother to watch their matches, look at their videos. We see they have a high OPR. We, people are using it as a crutch. Most people who talk about OPR have no idea what it means. They can probably tell you it stands for offensive power ranking, which is the most stupid thing that you could possibly know about it. They don't understand the linear algebra. Well, they don't understand what it means. Statistics have meanings. They aren't just numbers. It's like baseball fans who rhyme off about batting average for hours and hours. Batting average means nothing. It, it's such a flawed statistic. It could be a decent indicator to something, but there are better metrics for it. But because the baseball community is filled with sheep, bah, people just kind of believe. It's like if you see it, you see it, you believe it. So now in baseball, there's all sorts of new advanced stats. And people really like some of these defensive stats, like UZR, ultimate zone rating, and all these weird things. No one knows what they mean. People just accept it. It's like, you know, oh, Derek Jeter, he can't be a good fielder. His UZR is low. I have eyes. I know that Derek Jeter is a good fielder. Why are you telling me this? Maybe, but then that compelled me to do some research to figure out what these methods were measuring. You all need to figure this out on your own. And then try and find out where the true value is. Because the teams that are going to get ahead by using this data are the ones who are finding new ways to analyze the data and new ways to make the data more meaningful each year. Simply using, a using numbers like OPR in a vacuum is terrifying. I was talking to a, guy, a team last week at the Vectoral Champs, and he asked me, like, so are we automatically going to be eliminated from your scouting process because we have a low OPR? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? He's like, well, other teams have told us, like, you know, we're not in their top 40, they can't bother scouting us. I'm like, well, you know what? That's a good thing. You don't want to be picked by that team. <laughs> this goes for life. Oh, it goes for life. Being a sheep is not a good thing, other than if you want to be tasty on a plate. It, or, or make nice letters. Everyone wants to believe what they see. They just automatically believe. Sometimes that's a good thing. Okay. Social media. You see something on there, I hate to bring this up because again, people get upset, but this Coney 2012 thing. Coney's a very bad dude. There's no going back. Add 
absolutely awful person needs to be stopped. But the way everyone just jumped to that conclusion based on a seven minute video, just based on this one video without doing any research, that's not what we expect from our future leaders. You need to be able to evaluate things honestly. Because in the past, propaganda has been used to convince people that very good people were bad men and to persecute them. You need to evaluate everything you see in the media, which she dealt by as a form of. You need to evaluate it on your own. You need to do the research, figure out the background stuff, then make a decision. If you're just going to believe it because it has 37 likes on Facebook, man, we, we got trouble. We absolutely have trouble. The first community, we're talking to the leaders tomorrow, the best of the best. Make sure you live up to that reputation and you're always questioning things and you're always trying to figure out what truly is the best. Don't believe anything that I've said here just because I've said it. Believe it because it makes sense. Believe it because you've confirmed it through your observations. <coughs> it's very, very important. Don't just blindly believe. Don't blindly believe your teachers and professors. Listen to their lessons wisely and give them the benefit of the doubt because they're your teachers and professors, but don't believe blindly. Super, super important. Don't be a sheep. Unless you're team 2505. You're like a sheep. They don't even exist. Don't be a sheep. Okay, pit scouting. Pit scouting has its usefulness and it has its lack of usefulness too. Um, I think it's important to check out every team at the event. I mean, don't ask obvious questions like how many wheels they have on the robot. Look at your own eyes. I mean, how does that benefit? Can you really not count to four? <laughs> start on Thursday, actually, at this event. Start on Wednesday. You got five people that are allowed to the pit. They're already in there right now. Start taking pictures. Start figuring things out. Take three pictures of every robot, three views, make sure you get the number of the shots, it's Eastern now because the bumpers. Figure this stuff out. I mean, things to look for. I don't know, this year you might want to, might want to figure out if they're a long robot or a wide robot. Might be something interesting to know. How did I not talk about that? Let's go backwards. The decision between choosing whether to be long or wide this year was a very difficult decision for a lot of teams. In my opinion, most teams should have chosen to go wide. Because for most teams, the biggest way they were ever going to earn points was to be a part of a triple balance. Triple balance is easier to do while you're wide. If you were going to be, if your team couldn't be the best robot of either category, it's better to be a mediocre wide robot than to be a mediocre long robot. However, if you were going to build a long robot, you had to do it smart. You had to put your center of gravity on one side of the robot or the other so you could hang off the bridge. You probably should have had plans to have some sort of mechanism to keep that bridge level. And because by being a, wide, a long robot, you're a bit more maneuverable through defense. Like, yes, the robot has a hard time turning, but there's smaller gaps you can cut through. The long robots I've seen this year play better through defense. However, I mean, I feel bad for a lot of long robots at championship. Because there's going to be some very good long robots that will not make the elimination rates. They have good long robots, good shooting, good balancing ability. But there's a significant bias right now towards wide robots. Partly because of the sheep mentality, partly because it kind of makes sense. And a lot of teams are assuming long robots can't balance. Trust me, long robots can't triple balance. You can do a triple balance with two long robots. But it has to be done intelligently. And if you are a middle of the pack long robot, you need to redefine yourself and reinvent yourself the next couple days and find a way to stand out. Because there's going to be a lot of these out there, and only a few will sneak into the elimination round. And you need to have specific qualities, like being able to cross the barrier. If you're a long robot, really, in the next two, day and a half, or day before qualification matches, you might want to figure out how to cross the barrier so you can go to the other side of the field and play defense. It's not that hard to do. If you actually want to figure out who didn't want some help doing it, come to 11 14 step. We'll come, we'll show you what we did. Because essentially we took we took the kit ball on steroids and we made like little skis out of like a fat piece of metal and it just goes. It's a really simple addition. You might want to consider doing that. Or but you need to reinvent yourself to a certain degree. Because like I, I'm not trying to be all ominous doom and gloom, because you know. Limit like fears are often just an illusion, but you need to be wary of this. So 
That was a hard decision. Um, some teams made the right decision to go long. Some teams made the wrong decision to go long. A lot of it depends on the golden rules and all those other sorts of things. <coughs> yeah, so pit scouting. Look at the number of wheels, flash, and wheel type gearing and motors. If you look at all those factors, you can tell a lot about how a robot's going to perform on the field. Quality of construction can be a bit of a canary in the coal mine. It can tell you a lot without knowing something. Um, the amount of time put into a team's bumpers tells you a lot about a team. I'll just leave it at that. Use your own observations this weekend to see, you know. Because if you had time to make your bumpers look right, chances are that means you would darn really even have more time to be practicing. If your bumpers look like they went through the laundry, you know, it, it could be nothing. I mean, gee, what fourteen robots have hockey sticks and not hockey sticks, but golf clubs and other random stuff. Just pay attention. <coughs> okay, math theory. The most exciting thing to do in a competition. I, for the life of me, will never understand people who come to a first robotics competition and aren't interested in watching the matches and would rather be, you know, in the ice cream lineup or dancing the cotton eye Joe or whatever. Listen to the dancing song, dance to a good song, not a wedding song. Like, you should have Dougie or something, you know? Or, like, what? Just, oh, it kills me. <laughs> For inspiration and recognition of science, technology, and bad dancing. <laughs> Keep track of the match score. The amount of points scored by each team. Scoring attempts and failures. Very, very important to know teams accuracy. Accuracy rates are really important. It also proves something else to me. Going back to simplicity, a lot of teams fall at the idea of teams who just score the two-point basket. Um, if you score a two-point basket at 100 percent like some teams, um, team 33, 86, 36, 83 up in Waterloo, you can score at 100 percent You're pretty much better than every shooter in first except for 15 or 20. That's how many teams can actually shoot consistently at 70% or above. We'll talk more about this in scouting when everyone tells you, oh yeah, we're 90% shooters. No, you're, not. you're lying. No, you're not. <laughs> what was the number 14 shooting percentage at the first regional this year? Someone want to guess? Was one of the best scoring efforts of the season? 60%. 50. 50. And that was higher than most people except for 2056. We caught you at GTL. Um, shooting percentage went up for the season, but not for most teams. Most teams were in that 40 to 45 range. Teams missed a lot of shots. But the teams who were just focusing on two-pointers right up against the net, those numbers were considerably higher. And also in autonomous mode, in driver control, the difference between two and three points. Is, you know, it's a, it's a decent size difference. This is between six and five, a lot smaller. And if someone says it's exactly the same, they smack it. <laughs> Ratio people! <laughs> so, there was a good reason to go simple with that. And by looking at shooting percentages, you can tell the actual expected value of their shot. Expected value is a very, very important concept. You need to learn to embrace it. Because the team that's shooting three pointers at 50%, their expected value is three times 0.5, 1.5. You expect them to get 1.5 points per shot. A team that is shooting two pointers at 90%, you expect them to get two times 0.9, 1.8 points per shot. Who would you rather be with? Simple decision, right? Not so simple, because three pointers for the key are harder to defend than two pointers for the defender. It all comes together. Look at these things and don't discount the two point shooters in your division. That would be a big, big mistake. Or, you know, a really, really happy mistake to go to seventh or eighth lines and grab a wide bot and another wide bot for two point shooter and you pull it up, set up the number one seat. Penalties, please, please, please trap penalties. Because some teams were like penalty plague. They just go oh, the plague. <coughs> Autonomous mode and starting position. Why would you want to know where teams start in autonomous mode? You can't play defense on it, right? Well, if you're going to be paired with them, you want to know if they want to start the same spot as you. That's so, so important, otherwise you're fighting for the same spot. Shooting position in general. Um, general strategies and tendencies. Watch the drivers and human players. We found on our team one of the most interesting ways to tell if a team is going to do well in general. 
is how quickly they react to the bell and step up to their joysticks. And it's not a bell because you get there faster and you have more time to match. People on good teams are so determined, as soon as that bell goes, they jump. People on teams who don't really care and are here for the cha-cha slide, mosey up. The robots that react the fastest, it's a very interesting, discreet thing to watch. And anyone can do it. Don't make your entire pit list based on that. We want to talk about quantitative things. But it's something to look at. Look at these qualitative sorts of things. I can't wait till I see someone's scaling sheet which has the time help, time jump to the control. I can't wait to see that. The average, I'm sure someone will make an OPR for control time, and then every one of my team will give you put your red green dot and think you're awesome. Okay, math scouting. How do you do it effectively? Um, ideally, six people per match. One person to watch every robot. That's a good start. If you have eight, that's better, because you have six people watching matches, tracking data, two who watch the overall flow of the match. Um, in 2009, you could have had six guests, one that watched the robot. But in 2009, you also needed to track human players. That was important. So we did things with 12 guests. Hot used 18 scouts per match. One for robot scoring, one for robots being scored upon with your trailers, so two cards in one step track, and one for human players. The more data you collect, the better sometimes, because you need to be efficient. But it doesn't help, it doesn't hurt to have more people who want to do this. Very tiring, make sure you rotate your scouts, give your scouts breaks, unless you're on 11 or 14, where they're forced to sit in one spot and not move. <laughs> make it fun. Absolutely make it fun. So the sports you people that scout will result in unreliable data. It goes back to passion and enthusiasm. If you don't want to scout, trust me, you're just going to make up big numbers. Kids do it all the time, adults do it all the time. They just put stuff down there. So you shouldn't have to force people to scout, but you want everyone to keep the scout, so how do you get it? You make it fun. It's a culture shift. Just like we're trying to change culture, you know, to have scientists and technologists respected and whatever. I personally have a mission to make scouting more respected within first. And it works on within teams. Because the leadership of the team, the captains and the mentors respect scouting, the students will want to scout. On 11 14, we have lots of kids who want to scout. They find fun. We make it fun. We have Simbox, where we give out fake currency. And then we gamble on matches. So, <laughs> our, our team scout will say, all right, so, 2056, over under, 7.5 balls this match. And the scouts are trying to win. And they will watch matches, I'll think about for one second. They'll watch matches more intensely if they want to be able to predict these things. They're more into it if they want to have an educated opinion. So it's less of a chore now, and it's more of a game. Everyone loves games, everyone loves trying to win. You know, and I mean, I'm not endorsing gambling. I myself would never gamble, wouldn't do it. But <laughs> it's really neat to see, and it also proves you. It's like, wait a second, I can use these numbers to predict outcomes. And then suddenly the whole team realizes, wait a second, if we can predict these outcomes, maybe it can help us. Maybe these numbers actually mean something when we're doing our pick list. So instead of just trusting someone's random opinion of, oh, I really like their team, their power code looks nice. Maybe I really like their team because they have 73% shooting percentage. Make it fun. Everything at first should be fun, you know, and scouting can be fun. So if you're one of those people on your team who likes scouting, it's up to you to get that culture change. Just like it's all up to us to achieve culture change in the world and get first out there and get first, you know, on the media, in the news, in the media. But have your friends know about it. Changes within your school. You know, we don't want first just to be the little nerd group in the corner of BS. It's not the little nerd society. It's for everyone. Don't ever try and kidnap your team like that. You want the whole school in there. You want the jobs, you want the poplars. You want it to be like the breakfast club. That's no one said <laughs> No one was alive when that movie came out. Like <laughs> it's mixed managers. You need a way to keep track of it. I don't like the internet. I don't understand the internet. Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, and all these things confuse me. 
paper works really well. Pencil is even better than pens because you can erase. I love pencils. A nice mechanical pencil, really, really good thing. Not these wooden primary pencils, but a nice mechanical pencil. Have standard forms, so see your match reports. Every match, fill up the form, hand it to someone who does a binder. It's an important job, seriously is. Find a person who sorts them, puts them away, and then you have it all. And then just drop it into Excel. Nothing more fancy than that. Now, I know some people like to overcomplicate things. Just like I say, simplicity in your robot, simplicity in your scouting system. But hey, if you want to have a scouting system that requires you to have six laptops and a circular sound like a jet engine, that's cool too. <laughs> you know, it's an efficient way of doing things, requires composed difficulty sync, you know, whatever, but like, I mean, T1538, the holy cows, with Cal Scout, come up with something awesome. T148 does some really cool things, you know. So there are neat things you can do, and if you have time to invest in that, energy to invest in that, by all means, go do it. If not, anyone can scale with pen and paper. Um, the two RBs, uh, a couple years ago, put a white paper on sheet for scouting for just like a small team without very many resources. It's a totally, totally awesome thing. Definitely check, uh, recommend you check it out. Go on sheet, they'll find, search for white paper, by I. Alliance selection! Yay! Okay. So we survived through fall, you know, we went through the build season, we strategically designed, we got a robot, we scouted, and now time for alliance selection. How do we do this? Well, the whole process is dependent on scouting. Because no matter who you are and how photographic your memory is, it is nearly impossible to remember everything about all. 36 teams at a regional, 60 teams at a state championship, or 99 teams at a state. The only loss need to have your numbers and your scaling. So we've done that. We paid attention to the presentation. Many preliminary favorites on Friday night. Actually, this week, since we're going to probably play three or four matches on Thursday, make a preliminary pick list on Thursday. Review your scaling data. Discuss criteria. Like we said, you can't build a robot unless you know what you want to do. You can't pick an alliance partner unless you know what you want to do. You want to figure out what you're looking for in an alliance partner. So discuss the criteria, establish that. The annual list, ranked teams 1 through 28 based on the established criteria. Why do I say more than 24 teams? Because someone's going to break down on Saturday afternoon. And someone, you know, is just not, you're going to find out there are a bunch of jerks you don't want to work with them, see the next session. And yeah. They do not pick us. I guess this has become like a, a, a point of controversy or whatever. Do you have one or is it excessive? There are good reasons to not want to work with a team. Some of them this year would be just pure robot related in terms of that robot's awesome, my robot's awesome. If the two of us play together, we're not compatible and we can't. You know, that, that, that's one thing. That's a good reason to have someone on do not pick us. Um, a bad reason to have someone do not pick list is, well, that team stood in the stands in front of us, so we blacklisted them. <laughs> this actually happened last year. A team, a good team, went to a team, a better team, and said, yeah, you guys are standing in front of us. We're never going to pick you. Seriously? I mean, I'm sorry. It's not for anyone to tell another team how to run your team. And if you're that offended by someone standing up in front of you, <laughs> You know, I, I'm a short guy, I'm used to it, like whatever. <laughs> Some teams just can't work together. Some people just don't get along. I mean, an alliance is like a marriage. <laughs> Please don't marry someone you hate. <laughs> I mean, I think about some of the people in my life. They look like pretty good alliance partners, but I couldn't stand them. It's like, you look like a great alliance partner, but you're a tool. It should have been on do not pick list. There are some people in this world who are just what we call incompetent jerks, as Woody would say. <clears throat> Don't pick them. That's fine. Don't pick them. But please give them a chance. Don't just make predefined notes. Don't judge people without knowing them. But if there's some teams, and you've worked with them five times now, and you go to the board finals every time, maybe it's time to find new ones. I don't know. Either way, you know, do not pick list. It should not be something that stays with your team for like 10 years. At least clear it out every couple of years. You know. <laughs> Alliance selection. Okay. 
You have your list of five nights. This is where teams blow it. They make a list of five nights. You have time, you have scouting data, you make your list. And then they stop. And they just keep sitting with it on Saturday. You need to tweak the list on Saturday. However, you can't tweak it too much on Saturday morning. Because remember, all our brains work in a certain way where things that happen most recently, we weigh them more heavily. However, if it's two qualification matches versus eight qualification matches, be careful. The team was on the list on Thursday, Friday. There may have been a reason. Now, some teams just improve so much you want to put them on your list, you know? I mean, you got to play it very carefully. Twice in our history, we've taken teams who weren't on our pick list on Friday night and then picked them on Saturday. Once, it ended up with the uh, Australian World Championship 2008, Team 148. Another time, it ended up with probably one of the biggest upsets in first history. Sorry, guys. Um, so, be, you need to be careful on how you do this. This balance and everything you do. Your alliance captain. Your alliance captain needs to be absolutely level-headed throughout the process. There's a lot of things that can happen up there, and you need to be prepared for it. Um, the second thing is typically what makes and breaks your alliance. Very often breaks your alliance. Um, this year's game is pretty, the second pick plays a very key role. And if you pick a team with the wrong geometry, and I'm not just talking long versus wide, having maybe center of gravity hanging to over to one side on our back, it could, it could make it be a triple balance or not. That's 40 points. This pick is so, so important. Um, excellent teams always get missed in the first round. Why? Because teams don't scale effectively. And so, they're there. All right. Uh, there's a good thread on Chief Delphi about this. To break up alliances or not to break up alliances, it's a different alliance selection strategy. Every team should do what they want to do. Every team's going to have their own philosophy on this. Some teams will say, I don't want to get declined because it's insulting. That's fine. Go pick someone you know is going to say yes. Other teams will say, if I know team's not going to pick me, I'm going to pick them, actually pick them, to make sure no one else can have them. Good strategy, too. I don't see anything wrong with it. There's a lot of gray areas in some of the things we do in first. I don't think this is one of them. I think you're the number one seed and earn the right to do what you want to do. And this is something that's not like you're hurting someone on the field. It's not like you're throwing matches. You know, it's nothing awful like that. But you need to be careful in how you plan these strategies and where you take risks. Do you decline if you're out? Can you decline if you're out of the topic? <laughs> no, I would disagree with that answer. I would say it depends on the situation, it depends on the expected value of your outcomes. How likely is it that you're going to move into the top eight? And what can you do from there? I'm going to tell two separate stories. Uh, 2009, Finger Lakes Regional. Sorry, James. Sorry, Jane. I'll have to do it. What do you mean you weren't there? Oh yeah, you were. You were the one BBMing me in the whole process. While well, I'm on the field FC and my phone's just buzzing and buzzing. A team was in 10th place when they walked out onto the field. Out is the area for doing for line selection. We were allowed to play. No, you, listen. I'm telling a story here. You were in 10th place when Duncan, when Dunkaroo left the pits to come out towards the field. Unfortunately, they dropped to 11th spot while this had happened, and they didn't get updated. They declined. In 10th spot, thinking they would make it in. They didn't. That's really sucks. So you, why you need to be careful, because you're not in the elimination round. When you're not in the elimination round, you have no chance to win if you decline. For anyone who's wondering, you cannot be the backup bot. If you decline, you're out. We've had this clarified. If you decline, you're out. Otherwise, some team full of incompetent jerks would decline and wait for another alliance to break their alliance partner and bring in the awesome team. That would be shady beyond belief. That is when we say incompetent jerks. So yeah, you decline. Last year, on Galileo, we were the 14th, we were the 11th, we were the 10th seed going into alliance selection. And it was just like the most confusing set of circumstances. The number one seed, 1771, told us they were going to pick us. They're prerogative. 
a bunch of other teams, not even really us, but a bunch of other teams said, hey, if you're going to pick 14, that's fine. They'll be forced to accept you. You need to pick other teams in between to break up alliances. You don't want to see the possibility of 254 playing with 111. Because if they play together, they'll win the championship. 1771 didn't want to do that because they were afraid 111 would accept them. Would 111 have or not? We're not really sure. But they didn't want to take that risk. They thought it was a game being played to, keep, to make sure that 254 would get 1114. Why other random teams would get involved in something like that, I don't know. But they thought it was a game. It wasn't. It was just that's, that's that. So we had a decision to make. Do we accept it? Do we decline? We felt we had maybe a what? 5% chance of being able to win champs through 1771, less than that? Less. It, it wasn't going to be pretty for us. Especially because we would have to wait because of the serpentine draft. Yay. All the way around for the last 10. So, on the other hand, we didn't make the alignment when they shrouds. We'd have 0% chance. So you're like, oh, well, the decision is obvious, take 5% over 0. Oh, I don't know. Because if we decline, could we have made it into the top eight? Maybe. Well, hold on. So, say, follow the logic here. 1114 declined 1771. 1771 then picks Team 111. First brand to the flowchart. Team 111 accepts. Team 111 moves up. Uh, team one, we move up to 9 spot. Team 111 declines. Ooh, we're in a little bit of a trouble zone. Because now, we're stuck behind 111, and 111 can't be one of the inner picks because no one else can pick them now. So let's stay on the first side. 1771 picks 111. 254 comes out. They probably pick the next best team in the division, 469. Maybe 254 and 469 together. 8 fought, 1114. We're in the elimination rounds. If the draft works out the way, probably we would have. We'd probably grab 973 with the first pick. Suddenly have two fast mini boss in the division, we pick 341, second round. That's a nasty alliance, folks. 254 and 111 have been broken up. That's a nasty alliance. So, seems obvious, right? We should have, we made a mistake. Back up to Pocho. Back up. So, say 254 says, wait a second. What if we not pick 469? And what if we pick Team 40? Because they're outside the top eight. We could knock off on the best teams in our division first before line selection started. Now, I've talked to them before. They would not have done that fight. They said, no way. We respect 1114 way too much. We're not going to play that kind of game. That's not how we win. We win on the field. We don't play games. We're going to pick the best team. We're not going to pick another team that has a lesser value just for you. That's respectful. It's why Team 254 is a Hall of Fame team. No confident jerks there. But it's a strategic decision. Other teams might think that's an okay decision to make. If that's your decision, that's fine. But, so there's that risk. Go back a step. 1771 had picked. Say 1771 said, okay, we picked 1114. They've declined. Why don't we now pick 469? Because we think they'll decline. Keep 254 from being them. And then pick 111. There are a lot of variables in this line selection thing. Do I think we made the wrong decision? I don't know. I mean, our ultimate goal every season is to win the championship. We did. We weren't going to win that alliance. On the other hand, we played with 1771. <coughs> I had the opportunity to play with T294. It was absolutely awesome. So we made an awesome friend there. Um, I think the mentors and the students on the team would have been okay with declining and taking that risk in the elimination rounds. I don't know how our sponsors would have felt. I don't know how our school board would have felt. It's a big decision. It's not just based in numbers, because you're not just looking at the risk-reward. There's You have to look at the other factors that have come into play. This is a very difficult decision. Declining from the 10th slot to the 9th slot is something that's very, very hard to do. Go big or go home. Also, there's a lot of hindsight here. In no way do we expect our entire division to be so dumb to let 973 fall to the 23rd team to enter the elimination rounds. They were 6th or 7th on our pick list, had the fastest mini bot in the division by far. Also, with auto timer code, meaning they were always going to go. They were always going to win the race. Why they didn't get picked sooner is beyond me. 
That would be good. Or C5. I don't know. I, maybe I just told the story because I wanted to talk it out loud to myself. <laughs> maybe I did that. But I thought you guys might be interested in it. To break up alliances and not break up alliances, you got to figure out what's right for your team. Figure out how you want to play the game. Do what's right for you. Don't do what other teams are telling you to do. Do what you think is right. Because when alliance selection comes around, a lot of people are playing games. Frankly, this year, a lot of people are playing games. And they aren't always looking out for what's best for you. Figure out what's best for you and look out for it. Strategies should be different based on selection point. This is a, something that people miss. Okay, so say, I don't know, uh, whatever division has four sixty nine and 17, 17. Say four sixty nine is number one. Not really a stretch, they're freaking awesome. They pick 17, 17. Everyone's aligned selection strategy in that division needs to change at that point. You are not going to outscore them. Frankly, I think you could take any two robots from the rest of the first this year. They might not be able to outscore them. All over. So, if you're the eight alliance captain, your game really, really needs to change. Because now there are all the scoring threats that could possibly help you outscore them are gone. You now need to take risks. Let's talk about standard deviation. <laughs> if you're picking from the top, you always want a team that is a low standard deviation. Like, once you've got your first two picks. Why? You just need consistency. You don't need extra help. Typically, if you're a number one seed who deserves to be there, and you pick the best team in the division, you just need someone that's going to come along and always work, always get the job done. You're on the number eight alliance, you want a team with a high standard deviation. Because you want that team that their scoring staff, this was 2011, looked like 171171. One, one. Average is kind of low, but wait a second, those sevens. If you just happen to get a seven word final one out of them, a seven word final two, maybe you win. It's better than taking, you know, the two, three, two, three, two, three, guess what? I'm going home. Standard deviation matters. If you're the eight alliance, you obviously have to pick for defense. I don't see how there's any way to avoid it. This year's game, you go on to the defense and triple balance. Or, you might even have to say, forget about the triple balance. My only shot of winning is on penalties. So I'm going to park in front of the bridge and just have them drive me into the bridge. Oh, I hate that strategy. I think it's another one of those things I just don't like. But teams are going to do it. I, I mean, we'll find out if it's legal tomorrow's driver's meeting. I mean, everyone should tune in on the new field tomorrow. Because I think that driver's meeting is going to dictate what's going to happen in a championship. But your strategy should change. This goes back to why you want to have a level-headed alliance captain or level-headed people in the stands with a whiteboard. <laughs> <laughs> Funny story. This is one of my favorites. So it says that you're not allowed to use wireless communication at, at events. So one year, we were at an event, and we had our whiteboard ready. And a volunteer at the event came to us and said, you can't use the whiteboard. And we're like, uh, we don't think there's a rule against that. So he leaves, comes back, you can't use the whiteboard. Why not? No wireless communication. <laughs> <laughs> we were tempted to go back to the pit to take a cable to it. <laughs> Anyone got time? Five, five, four, All right. Okay, math strategies. This is very good stuff. I never get to this part of my presentation. <laughs> Except in Canada, where they just let me talk and talk and talk. <laughs> Planning and execution, the most important part of competition. Good strategy in sailing can allow a mediocre robot to win the majority of its matches. Yes, it's true. Good strategy and a good robot are an almost unbeatable combination. Why does 177 go to Einstein every year? Strategy! The robots are not always the great robots. The last year's robots are pretty, pretty impressive compared to some of the past ones. But they strategize so well. They figure things out. They peak at the right time. Strategy takes you far. I mean, some teams win because they have really, really good coaches. There's no, I mean, a lot of people will debate this, and maybe I'm saying this because he's my boss. But teach you something the butter chickens? They win a lot because of Paul Copioli's influence in the box. There's coaches out there, Paul Copioli. 
Raul Oliveira, they know how to win because they're really, really good at strategy, or they have good strategists behind them. Take a look at the teams that you call powerhouses and you call elite, and there'll be a common thread. And a common thread is not money, it is not machine resources, it's strategy. Before the event, you develop a set of strategies. You need to know what you can do. There it is again. You need to be able to evaluate honestly and realistically what you can do. Because if you're a team that can, you know, it takes you 40 seconds to pick up three balls, your strategy has to be based around that. It's fine if that's all you can do, but you need to play your strengths. Be honest. Don't under or overestimate. Overestimating is the one that kills me. And when you're working with your alliance partners, you need to be honest with those. There is nothing good that will be accomplished when you tell your alliance partners, yeah, we get 90% of our shots. Because if they believe you, they're going to plan their strategies around you taking less shots, or maybe go in balance of risk a lot earlier. You need to be honest. This isn't about, you know, just like, first of all, you should always be honest. And all this lying has been happening even first. Why anyone feels the need to lie to anyone is beyond me. I mean, I'm one of those type of competitive people you know, but there's lines to be drawn. And I, I, there's no reason to go to someone and give them false information. It's just BS. Be honest, factor in the abilities of your drivers. I mean, I've had a team come and tell us before, hey, I was like, hey, we want you to play the back sets in 2010. Like, oh, we love you, but we don't, our drivers are not ready to play the back set. I've had so much respect for them for, that, for telling us that. Because then we would change our strategy accordingly. Because some teams will just be like, oh yeah, Baxo, oh yeah, Baxo. And then they'll go back and be like, hey, you're going to go for the first time this season. What's the point? What's the point? You're an alliance, you work together. It's okay to be like, yeah, we can't do that. I mean, I respect that. Uh oh, doors are opening. What? <laughs> <laughs> We have playbook, awesome map strategies that we run. You want to have different head strategies, different circumstances. Defensive strategies, high risk strategies, pull them out at the right time. <laughs> Develop a plan for each match with your partners. Everyone's got to agree on the plan, or chaos will ensue on the field. I see it all the time when you have three key shooters in the match. All trying to occupy the same spot in the key. Take turns, tag in, tag out. If you do it, it's, very, it's beautiful. I mean, in 2011, there were some teams when we were watching them work together on the field, going into the lane and out of the lane, it was like an art form. I mean, there's some matches with some high scores that were just gorgeous, like in, out, in, out, human players throwing the balls in face. That is strategy. That is how it works. Create time limits on action. Every year, there will be the team who will spend 50 seconds trying to score the same two. And it's now deflated, and it's hanged on their arm, and they're still trying to score it. Drop the tube! Put the tube down! Go get another one! This year, like, I'm going to lower the bridge. I'm going to lower the bridge. I'm going to lower the bridge. Get out of the way! Let someone else lower the bridge. Two robots trying to balance. Two robots trying to balance. They're trying to Charlie Brown the bridge. What does that mean, Michigan? What does that mean to Charlie Brown the bridge? Sorry, I'm Michigan. I can't apologize for it. I love Tom, but I don't know what he's saying. Okay. But forget about Charlie Brown the bridge. What if you get off and let the other balance the bridge? <laughs> Many teams lose matches because they don't abandon failed objectives. Admit when you're a failure, it's okay. I can't grow hair anymore. I admit. I shave my head, I'm still really good looking. <laughs> Every map needs to have contingencies. What do I do if my intake doesn't work? What do I do if I can't lower the bridge anymore? What do I do if my partner gets tipped over in the first 20 seconds of the match? What do I do if the control system fails on me? That's what you really think about. <laughs> Winning the match is the first priority. Showcasing features is secondary. Not playing to win is no different than throwing a match. Match throwing, I don't even know why we have to have this discussion. But I guess it's similar as teams who unback the robot work on a road. You shouldn't be doing that. We know teams do it. We have no way of stopping it. We know teams throw matches. Teams talk about it. There's nothing we can do about it. It's gonna happen. My advice to you, don't do it. Don't be an incompetent jerk. We're better than that. 
I hope we never get to the point where we have to legislate something like that, because if we do, it shows that we've lost our path. Because our path is that we're trying to prove that we can do things better, that gracious professionalism actually means something. And we can do that. We're not going to let this 1% or 0.1% force us to change the way the other 99.9% do things. Not going to happen. Cop and jerks and kiss something. <laughs> Never mislead your partner about your own abilities. We talked about that earlier. Talked about that earlier. It's okay. Coach your match. Coach is super, super important. Um, people try to speak it here. <coughs> Basically, drivers can only be watching their robot and nothing more than just what's around the robot. Who watches everything? The coach. The coach is so important. The coach is everything on the field. Drivers, you can play a monkey to drive. I mean, you really can. Anyone, can, I'll tell you what a monkey at the Florida Zoo, that, can, that pays his own rent. He's a monkey, he pays his own rent. I'll tell you what that happens. Anyone can do that coaching? Not so much. Some people are very bad at it. Some people, when they step into the box, it's off. I've seen teams go from terrible to Einstein with the change of a new coach. Watch it. The coach makes all decisions to deviate from strategy, not the drivers. Why? The drivers aren't watching the whole field. Coach stuff. Always need to keep the drivers aware of what's going on. Because the driver should be doing only what the coach says. However, if the driver is that dependent on the coach, the coach can never leave the driver name. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, good. Okay. During math, you always have to be able to make decisions on the fly. Too many teams need math because they behave in a very static manner. I mean, there were some teams that were so predictable in 2007, you knew the exact order of what tubes they were going to place, where they were going to place them. If a team figured that out, you could easily send your third robot to sit in that first spot. And then they would spend 40 seconds trying to fight over that spot, because they wouldn't realize that there was a failed objective. Drivers don't have time to look at the clock. Coaches do. You shouldn't do it. Everyone needs to focus on the match. Tune out the crowd. Tune out the announcer. If you in the math can tell me afterwards what the announcer said, you probably shouldn't be on the right team. <laughs> Never lose sight of the main goal. Winning the match. If you fall behind, don't panic. Calmly reevaluate, come up with a new plan. This is a lot easier if you develop contingencies. Leave it on, on the field. Give it your all. Don't be afraid of damage. That being said, don't take overly dangerous risks. I've done that as a coach before, they still don't shut up about it. <laughs> I just figured someone would fix the robot, not my job. <laughs> After the match, sit down with a key team member, discuss what went right and what went wrong. When you come home from school with a bad report card, don't just give it to your parents and have them yell at you. Figure out why you did poorly. If you got a test and you have a mark on it, you got a 65, figure out where you lost the other 35%. If you got a 99 on the test, I don't care. I want to figure out what you did wrong. Not because I think that you did something, like, you know, you didn't do great, you did awesome, you were, you were great. But the only way you can improve is to look at our failures, not dwell on our successes. Uh, after a few matches, you'll figure out which strategies are really, really stupid, you'll get rid of them. This especially applies to your first regional year, because beforehand you think of all these crazy things that'll be really important and it turns out they're not. You have to adapt to the competition, because they're going to be adapting to you. Change things up. If you do the same thing over and over again, the teams who pay attention to this presentation and were silly will figure it out and they will catch you. This usually happens in the quarterfinal 3.1. Not even perfect. Don't be too conservative or too risky. Know your own abilities. Don't run to too much on that. Figure out how long to miss. Slow and steady wins the race. Go slow to go fast. Go slow to go fast. Think about it. In 2011, every or this year, people rush into the key and bang, bang, bang. Take your time to line up. Those three balls that you just shot and you missed, it's going to take you, you know, like five seconds if you're a 469, 15 seconds if you're a normal team to go get up for a one. <laughs> Preparing for the finals. Hi, Pauline. Hi. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> Preparing for the finals. Yeah, do it. <laughs> Final comments, read the rules. Come up with a clear consistent strategy for how your robot will play the game. Remember your golden rules. Remember the quotes I told you about. Nothing great was ever achieved without enthusiasm. Limits, like fear, are often just an illusion. 
Each first round is like a high speed game of chess. You need to have a well thought out plan and be prepared to turn your opponent's moves. Have fun, passion, enthusiasm, strive for excellence in everything you do. Resources. Go to symbotics.org. Come up here if you have an iPhone. Scan this barcode. Download the Sync Phone app. There are so many good things. This whole presentation is on there. This video will get up there. We're going to have throw a probe of other stuff onto that app. We're going to port it for Android this summer. Questions I'll take outside the room. If you want to find me, I hate the internet, but I use it. Um, find me, ask me questions. If you want to know about sailing, if you want to know about sabermetrics, if you want to know how to look this good, all these sorts of things I can get you answers. I can't promise you solutions. Sorry, Austin. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I had a professor at the University of Waterloo who would always say, I will not wish you good luck because luck is something we cannot control. However, I will wish all of you success this weekend. Thank you.